like her, her entire closing argument is, so you're saying there's a chance. Yes. Right. Which, by the way, the answer to what she's saying is there a chance of is literally no. Yep. Right? Is it possible that God chalked that 19-year-old full of demons so that we'd believe in his son? Nope. No, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> is it a fact that she was psychic and hypersensitive, like the expert said? Nope, no. No, I, I, it is definitely. We can do this all day. <laughs> no. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because. They're better than watching reality at this point. I'm your host, No Illusions, and unfortunately, Heath will be unable to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I don't want to do spectacular anymore. This one got sad. <laughs> yeah, this is depressing. Like this right? <laughs> This this ruined my spectacular. <laughs> it really did, man. Uh, we'll get there. But also joining us today, uh, sitting one pond to my east, is my neutral friend, Michael Marshall, host of Be Reasonable, co-host of Skeptics with a K, editor of Skeptic Magazine, and project director for the Good Thinking Society. Marsh, welcome back. Thank you. Um, this film is in the top 100 scariest films of all time by several different ratings. And I think they're right, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. The oh, fact that it's God, on that list is actually among the scariest 100 things that I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's our jump scores were at the wrong times. They were on radio delays, right? Everyone else is like, oh, that clock moved. And we're like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Who greenlit this shit? Yeah. <laughs> During the credits. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's, let's make it official there. Uh, tell us, Marsh, what will we be breaking down today? So we watched The Exorcism of Emily Rose, and it's the true story of a teenager in real life. She was called Annalise Michelle, whose epilepsy and schizophrenia caused her strict Catholic parents to think that she was possessed by demons. So they had a priest take her off her medication, subject her to 67 separate exorcisms, and ultimately starve her to death. Yep. And that story alone would make this a horror film. But instead, the guys who made this film went with but what if she actually was possessed so they could make her killers the good guys? Yep. Yeah, right, right, exactly. It's, 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 it, it's a horror movie from the monster's perspective, but they don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, and, and Eli, how negligently homicidal was this movie? <laughs> Let's see. Well, if you love based on a true story horror movies, but you're, Andrea Yates screenplay just hasn't gotten accepted yet. <laughs> you will love this movie. Yeah, I mean, like, if if this movie didn't kill off any schizophrenics, it's because it didn't find a wider audience. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Oh, God. And I was reading into this film because it, it's directed by the guy, it's written and directed by the guy who directed Doctor Strange, the Marvel films. This is proper studio stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it was co-written by him and a guy who was a skeptic because the guy who, who wrote this, who directed it, is a believer. But he had that sort of balance of have a skeptic and a believer write it so they could have some balance and ambiguity as what really was happening. But then he directed it as the believer and took all the ambiguity out and made it, yeah. oh, it's all right, demons is real. Oh, God. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Okay, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, I mean, I just have to say best worst based on a true story. Yes. <laughs> Previously, you guys had me on this show to talk about the, the 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 Corkville miracle, you know, which was about someone trying to blow up a bunch of kids and failing. And I thought that's an inappropriate way to discuss a true life story <laughs> and try and crowbar in there a Jesus message. But this is, we tortured a mentally ill girl to death because we believe in magic and we are the good guys. That's this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, man, this was a tough one. So yeah. I was going to go with best worst title. Right. Because like building on what Marsh was saying, the idea of this movie is that they wanted to present this situation and say, like, was it demonic possession or was it mental illness? But the title of the movie is it was totally possession, though. Right. Like yeah. The name mm -hmm. of yeah. the movie should be the negligent homicide of Emily Rose, if we're being honest about it. But <laughs> or, I mean, but or the tragic death of or something like that, if we're trying to hedge our bets. But the exorcism of. 
kind of tips your hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, by the way, even according to their own story, as we'll get to, they don't think they exercised her. They <laughs> tried that. Yeah. and failed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's their version. The repeated attempted exorcisms <laughs> of... Yeah. The botched exorcism of Emily yeah, Rhodes was... is their version. <laughs> the college try of Emily <laughs> Rhodes. And of course, I'm going to go with best, 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 worst lawyer. Oh, God. Okay. Not only is she a bad lawyer in terms of like representing her case and getting her client acquitted, she's just terrible at humaning throughout this movie. We've watched a courtroom drama that turned out to be hell for a bunch of people who had had or participated in abortions. And this lawyer was bad by comparison. Yes. <laughs> by comparison. Yes. And uh, uh, by the way, there, as we go through this movie, there's a lot of people are probably going to wonder why we didn't have Andrew Torres, our, our awesome lawyer friend, guesting on this episode. You'll find out the answer to that next week. I don't want to spill the beans, but you'll find out why next week. Anyway, is it because you like him? Is it because you actually like him? <laughs> More than we like you? Um, no answer. I, I, let me let me ask Andrew what I should say on that, uh, legally speaking. <laughs> and while I do that, uh, we've got you know plenty of symptoms of mental illness to demonize on the other side of the break, so we're going to keep it brief. And when we come back, we'll dive into all the negligent homicide that is the exorcism of Emily Rose. And then we make the glue look like cocaine. Look, I'm telling you, if, if we just hold him down while I pluck him, it's, it's going to be way less trouble. Hey, guys, uh, what, are you, what are you diagramming there? Oh, Noah, perfect. We're trying to figure out how to deal with Heath's nose and ear hair. Do you think we should tackle him and pluck? Or should we trick him into doing a line of glue and then pull? Hmm. Wow, that's tricky. Why don't you just get him the new weed whacker nose and ear hair trimmer from Manscaped? Oh, uh, what's that? I mean, it's pretty obviously a nose and ear hem- trimmer. Shut you know, up, Marsh. You don't know. You don't know. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with the Weed Whacker. This nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360-degree rotary dual-blade system. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience, and it's waterproof, which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Mm, that does sound good. And right now, our listeners get 20% off and free shipping with the code AWFUL at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code AWFUL. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weeds. Fantastic. No, I will do. Oh, good. So you guys aren't going to need that line of Coke there? Oh, oh, this is this is glue, Noah. Well, still, though. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you guys didn't invite me to lunch. Look, I'm telling you, Dave, it wasn't really a planned thing. You know, I just I texted Kyle, do you want to go to Grimaldi's? Well, next time, text me too. I want to go to Grimaldi's. Well, well I will. I, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, if I may, I want to call this meeting of the men who are still somehow inexplicably screenwriters to order. First up, uh, Kevin, how are those 19 scripts that you're simultaneously writing based on the idea that we only use 10% of our brain coming online? Oh, yeah, no, really great. Um, I've got one with a magic pill, uh, Mm -hmm. one with a super genius baby, and there's uh, one where Scarlett Johansson gets telekinesis. A fantastic use of time and money. Yeah, thank you. All right, so on to new business. Time for another one of these uh, based on a true story horror movies. But, you know, since ghosts aren't real, we're going to need to tell the story of someone who's either lying or mentally ill. Or both. Right, yes. Yeah, we can also do both. So, uh, gentlemen, let me hear your worst ideas. Okay, what about my neighbor? So she actually thinks her house is haunted since her husband died and she's really sad and lonely and it's obvious that this is super upsetting her. So, Hmm. okay, Uh, it's good, but let's see how it plays out. If she dies, I'm in. Ooh, all right. Ooh, um, uh, speaking of dying, uh, what about the story of Annalise Michel? Uh, That's the German teenager who was tortured to death by her family and her priest for her mental illness and none of them ever faced any real consequences? Yeah, yeah, that's her. Um, we, we could, like, make a movie about her story. Oh, so, like, a, about how terrifying it must have been to have a mental illness that everyone around you kept confirming was real? Uh, I mean, I was thinking more like, what if she was filled with demons? Okay, all right, sorry. You want to make a movie about the tragic story of a schizophrenic teenager whose parents literally starved and beat her to death, and your take is that maybe they were right to do that? Yes. 
Well, I can't think of a story more evil than that. Let's do it. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Oh, wait. I actually I've got a worse one. You do? Really? Jean Benet Ramsey. Absolutely not. No. See, this is why we don't invite you to lunch. Oh. And we're back for the breakdown, and we're gonna open up on some screams and some panting. And the words based on a true story. <laughs> this was the scariest and least scary horror movie of all time. We'll get there. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, my notes originally said at this point, oh, this is going to be like generic, unsubtle horror film. And I went back over those notes midway through the film to write that the uh, screens here, the opening sequence was actually the least exploitative part of the entire film. Yeah. The opening yep. seconds are the best it gets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we've got we're opening on this uh, medical examiner showing up to this creepy old farmhouse filled with wasps and cats. (laughs) Yeah, we see this this massive abandoned field of pumpkins, which is, you know, welcome to Halloween 2020. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, we spend a solid minute. I'm glad you mentioned the bees, Noah, because we spend a solid minute of him staring at them. And I was like, oh, later in the movie, she's going to spit some bees or shit. A b- nope. No. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> just just spooky, isn't it? Having some bees around there. <laughs> right. So like this movie constantly does that, though. That's because because it's, you know, quote unquote, based on a true story. Nothing ever fucking happens. Right. So it constantly <laughs> has to tease you like, oh, that's like the setup for a horror movie scene. Huh? Right. Bees. <laughs> bees. Anyway. Any yeah. other thing. We, we just have a 19 year old who was mentally ill. So it's hard to pop scare with that. Well, this is two two times in this opening scene, right? So we get the bees that don't add up to anything. And then like he looks over and somebody's creepily looking at him out the window. But then she just opens the window and she's like, are you the, med- you're the medical examiner? I'll come down. Let me come down, right? <laughs> and the thing is, it's the priest up in the window. And you know, whenever you see a priest sort of peering through upper curtains of a bedroom room, like suspiciously like that, that's never a good sign. It's, it's never <laughs> indicative of something okay. happening. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that was the priest. That is creepy. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and the priest is Tom Wilkinson. Yeah. Tom yeah. Wilkinson, Lord, it's a proper cast. Yeah, it's This sad. wasn't even shot somewhere fun. They have no excuse. None. <laughs> well, so we were saying before the record, like if this was one of those weird ass movies where you've got to like log into some special site and you can't get there, there through those like fancy regular web browsers, you know, then fine. Right. Like if this is something seven people did on a fucking iPhone, then fine. You know, we would watch this and we'd make fun of it and it wouldn't be terrifying. But this was a major motion picture with like a director that went on to direct other movies and actors you've heard of. Ugh. Yeah. Although I will say the movie does kill its own mood here because as it's panning over the creepy farm, there are two morbidly obese cats. <laughs> oh, the little chunkers. <laughs> Some chunkers up in there. fucking kill the mood. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, terrible things have happened in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, all right. But this is the medical examiner. He's showing up where this person has died. And so we get like the creepy him walking past the grieving family thing all in slow motion. (laughs) Oh, God, he's walking so slow. And I get that they're trying to make it slow. So it's all stillness and atmospheric. But he's walking so slow. It's just obscene. Like my sister has cerebral palsy and genuinely she'd be yelling at him to keep up. That's how slow (laughs) he's walking. (laughs) Yeah. So we saw he goes into the death room where the cops are. And he comes out and he's like. Okay, yeah, sorry. This is not one of the legal ways that people die. Uh, We (laughs) need to arrest somebody at least. As I was watching, I wrote in my notes, again, as a joke, I want the medical examiner to come back in and be like, so you guys murdered your daughter, huh? And he basically does that. Yeah. He's like, "Mm." The only reason he doesn't say that is because he doesn't finish the sentence where he's saying that, basically. He's like, your daughter, she... Mm, and then they just stop. It's like, yeah, because the only end to that sentence is she's dead and it's your fault, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the cops have to awkwardly arrest the priest. The cops are like, hey, father, can we speak to you real quick? You are, oh, I hate to be this guy. You're under arrest for the murdering. You know the murder you did? The, <laughs> just now? One? Just earlier today? <laughs> oh, apparently that's not a, a warning. I asked. I radioed back and said, can I give him a verbal warning? But you know, yes. it's almost the holidays and that's I, I quote us. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so then we cut. To, so he's under arrest. The press is all crowding and Father Moore's shit on the way into the jail or the courthouse or some damn thing, wanting to know why he killed that teenage girl. 
right? Yeah, and we get that classic thing with the reporters where they they shout out just little fragments enough to make the plot to, to come together. So mm. the reporters are shouting, "Father, tell us about the exorcism," which just might as well have been like, "Father, could you just throw us a little chunk of plot just so we can get, yeah. the, <laughs> get, the, get the game moving here?" <laughs> so. Yeah, so we get that scene and then we get all the lawyers that are going to prosecute him and they're sitting around this table like talking about like, oh, this is going to be tricky. He obviously murdered her, but he's religious. So (laughs) do laws count? Oh, it's going to be tough. This is tricky. And that's true. That's true. I don't know if you know this works, but that is how it works here. Laws tend not to count if you're religious. Yeah, yeah. That becomes re- pretty obvious throughout this film as well. And I, I also love the bit where they, they're saying about the prosecutor they're going to pick. It's like, we need a Christian on this and preferably a Catholic. And I wrote, yeah, that's a view shared by the Federalist Society. So <laughs> consistency across America. And I thought, hang on, no, this can't be the Federalist Society because there's two people of colour here and one of them is a woman. So there's yeah. no way this is actually them. Right. Yeah. And the other one seems to be in charge. So definitely <laughs> not the Federalist Society. Yeah. So, yeah, but they need to find themselves a good Christian prosecutor. Then, meanwhile, we cut to this bar where Laura Linney is hard at work lawyering, even at the bar, right? (laughs) I love the way they introduce her character. Her boss comes over and he's like, this is Laura Linney. I know what you're thinking, a lady lawyer, but don't worry. She's also an alcoholic, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) And like, this is a really small thing, but there's lots of people there drinking martinis. None of them are eating the olives. Are you meant to leave the olives in martinis? Have I been doing it wrong? (laughs) You're asking the right people, let me tell you, Marsh. (laughs) If anybody knows how to properly consume alcohol. (laughs) Where is Heath when I'm I'm eating? That's the question. But I get judgy looks when I order nothing but olives. So see, I'm on the opposite (laughs) end of the spectrum, Marsh. I get it. Oh, and there's this point as well where she's talking to, to to some of the other lawyers in there and they say to her, have you seen the news about the priest? And I thought, you got to be way more specific than that. Yeah, like, right. Even within a subset of <laughs> things that priests have done that criminal defense lawyers might want to hear about, you still need to be more specific. Yeah. You can name a magazine things priests have done that criminal defense lawyers might hear about. <laughs> <laughs> One would argue we have a whole other podcast called Yeah, things right. Yeah, exactly. Done <laughs> But yeah, so but she's being called upon to defend the murder priest, right? Yeah, in what they describe as an exorcism gone bad, like there are lawyers out there who are going, well, I mean, if it was a routine exorcism, it would be fine. But this was this is one that went bad. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, so yeah, so Aaron Brockovich, I don't know, like I'm I got her as Laura Linney in my notes. She goes to see Father Moore in the jailhouse, right? Oh, and we should also point out, by the way, that like 33 times in this two minute period of the film, they dropped the name James Van Hopper. Oh, God, it's so weird because she's constantly saying about how she got James Van Hopper off and how he was going to fry, but she got him exonerated and got him released. And then she goes to see the, the, the priest now and she mentions James Van Hopper. It's like, why are you dropping that name quite so often? Like, yeah, like we get it. You knew James Van Hopper. Like, where is he that important? Where's his movie? Can we watch his movie instead? We find out he's a murderer. I'd rather be watching that film than he admit he's a murderer. <laughs> well, something <laughs> happened in that one, at least. Yeah. <laughs> right, so yeah, so she goes to see the the priest. She's like, I don't know if you if you heard me. I defended James Van Hopper, and he's like, Oh well, you know, we just spent two minutes of movie introducing that. That's a big fucking deal. So yeah, obviously I know who that is. And so he asks, he's like, Hey, are you Catholic by any chance? She says, I'm, I'm agnostic, I think. And I'm like, Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, <laughs> you did it. <laughs> and so, so we have to have the like the scene where she sells herself to him. As the lawyer, you know, he doesn't want her at first, so she has to convince him to take her help. Yeah, she tells tells him how hard the DA is on priests. <laughs> oh, and there's a line as well. He says, uh, you know, the DA's office doesn't like it when religion holds itself above the law. And it's like, I've got some bad news for you, movie from 2005. Like, change in the last 15 years. <laughs> it's, it's hard to find a statement less true than the DA's office doesn't like it when religion holds itself above the law. You have to get into metaphysics for some untrue shit yeah. at that level. <laughs> no shit. And he tells her, he's like, hey, look, you know, what I want most is to make sure that other children die of stupidity torture in the future. So I don't care if I get exonerated for this. I just want to tell the story and muddy the waters about whether mental illness is sometimes possession. That's what matters to me as a priest. Yeah, I want to tell my crazy story. And Laura Linney's like, I mean, did you murder her in your crazy story? Because no, right. You should not <laughs> tell your crazy story. It ends with you murdering her. Yeah. 
And then, okay, so I love this. We're, we're going to cut over to a quick scene where Laura Linney is meeting with Emily Rose's mom. But to introduce the scene, we get just a random desperate pop scare from a cat. <laughs> right? It's just like, ooh, horror movie, horror movie. See? 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 It's still a horror movie. Oh, God, this cat. I mean, so it turns out that, like, they've got lots of cats. That's a that's a, a fact that Laura Linney establishes by saying a lot of cats live here, which is a really fucking weird way of expressing that sentiment uh, right? to begin with. <laughs> but the cat that's there that does the pop scare hiss is the single biggest mammal I have ever seen <laughs> in my life. Like, they say she's got 11 cats, and I think this cat is at least six of them. It's huge. <laughs> There's... There's no question someone brought their cat from home and no one had the heart to be like, hey, Dave, your cat's morbidly fucking obese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the way that they established that there's 11 cats here is they have cats just crying in the background of every scene. <laughs> so, yeah, she's talking to the mom and the mom's like, you know, I'm sure our ways seem very strange to you. And Laura Linney's like, that's not like an idiosyncratic thing, though. Like, it wouldn't matter who you were talking to when you said that. You're you're just fucking weird. Uh, it was actually quite difficult to even see them on because everything in the house was like a brownie grey, including her, including yep. her hair, including yep. her, her cats. Everything just blended into one colour palette. It was it was like a magic eye or something. I just thought the screen <laughs> to make it pop out. You have to look through the movie, yeah. Marsh. Yeah. You gotta cr cross your eyes and walk backwards. You can see the film. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so but the mom explains that. Before the ivory tower elitist liberals at college got a hold of her, Emily Rose was a happy girl, right? Yep. Yeah, it's like they're, they're saying that she caught demon at the university. Like she went to the university and caught demon. <laughs> well, or mental illness. She caught one of those at college. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. So and that leads, of course, to mom reminiscing us into a doodly do about when Emily got into college. Yeah, it's like a flashback to when the house also included orange. So it was, uh, it was <laughs> a brighter time in their lives. Yes. <laughs> oh, she gets the letter and mom takes it. And she's like, I'm going to show this to your father. I mean, it doesn't have pictures, but he'll get it. I'll tell him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now it's time for us to meet Ethan Thomas, the evil Christian prosecutor who I have down from this point on as just protagonist. <laughs> oh, God, yes, so absolutely. good. Okay, there's a really small thing just before we meet him as well, because like the int the introduce that scene with like a newspaper report freeze frame, uh, like yeah. newspaper mm -hmm. report kind of flash up on screen. And obviously, when you see that, the first thing you do is pause to just make out what they've put in the newspaper. Because it's always really funny to see like the newspaper props. They always read like they've been written by a, a prop team who've never who've like basically only ever had a newspaper described to them. <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah, they've exactly. been told to, to produce that. <laughs> but one of the lines in the newspaper report, it's my favorite line of it. It says, "An exorcism was performed." but failed to have any lasting effect. I mean, bearing in mind she died, I, I argue it's <laughs> lasting effect. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, shit. So, yeah, so this is the lawyer's meeting beforehand. And the prosecutor comes up and says, hey, look, you know, Christianity's above the law. We don't pretend otherwise. We'll give him six months. We'll give him less time than uh, Noah would get for an ounce of wheat, basically. Right. Right. But no deal. He wants it to go to trial because he wants to, like, tell her story on the stand. Yeah, and it, it, she's trying to persuade him to let him off, basically, because she's sort of saying, "Isn't she says, isn't forgiveness and compassion part of your creed? And she's arguing that a prosecutor should be lenient on account of negligent homicide because he's religious. That's the argument she's putting forward here. <laughs> yeah, well, because, but, but it was religious negligent homicide, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the prosecutor's great here. He's just like, no, not that kind of Christian. I understand why you'd be confused with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the law abiding ones. Well, and it's great too because when like she turns down the the deal and she says, "Nope, it's going to trial." Like he go, he does a giant fist pump and a hooray, <laughs> has a little parade out. I'm like, that's never a good sign when you're a defense lawyer. I think. No, no, bring your guy. I want to hear his story. I'm sure it's gonna go great. Ah, <laughs> oh, and it's there's a lovely bit as well because she says like he was never neglectful, and uh, the prosecutor says never neglectful. Have you seen the post mortem photographs? And she hasn't. She just took his word for it because she's such a good defense attorney. He's like, yeah, I'm. I'm sure he's probably right. He said he's not, he didn't do it. So I'm, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. I don't see how those photos are relevant to <laughs> the case. So, okay. So now she's, she's lawyering late into the night and we know that because her notes are on yellow paper. That's lawyer paper. <laughs> I really wanted it to pan over her notebooks and the only note she has is demons equal real question mark? <laughs> <laughs> no, but what's, 
what she does have is she's got two post-it notes that are right next to each other yes. that both say the same thing. Yes. Dr. Briggs, medical degree, psychiatry, John Hopkins. Same thing both <laughs> <days. Brilliant>. Right. <laughs> All right, but then we get it. She goes to bed and we zoom in on her watch, eerily stopping at exactly 3 a.m. Because this movie has fucking nothing. Okay. Nothing. So we're we're in a court now for for their opening statements. See, Andrew, I said opening statements. Mm. (laughs) Whatever. Their thing's called Lot Awful Movies. Come at us. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So the protagonist starts off, right? And he's like, uh, yeah, so. this is this girl that had a serious medical condition and then this guy tried to fix her with magic and she's dead. Uh, do we need to do the whole objection, all of that stuff with the hammer or, or what? <laughs> why, why? Yeah. And I have to admit, I was actually like moved. I was having a real moment. And then he pulls out the, the headshot <laughs> of the actress who plays <laughs> Emily Rose. And I was like, oh, okay, good back out of the moment because he is gives like a genuinely good speech about the, the horrible he does he does our job for five minutes in yeah this movie. right but then he pulls out what is very clearly this actress's headshot and i'm like okay and we're back to comedy town thank you thank you <laughs> and he, he does do an excellent point and he just makes a series of absolutely crushing points he's brilliant but he does at one point say a line in his uh, opening statement which is fantastic he says i represent the people and i know that sounds a little abstract so let me explain I represent the people. <laughs> he <laughs> does <laughs> the exact fucking quote. <laughs> One juror is just taking notes. Oh, okay, that's what that means. <laughs> no, all right, all right. People. So, and and two, like, so he pulls out the picture, right? He says, here's Emily Rose before, like, the exorcisms and everything. And he's, like, he pulls out this other picture. He says, and here she is right before the priest killed her. And she's, like, all fucked up and her teeth mm. are all broken and her eyes are all blacked out and she's obviously like been all the way fucked up but i feel like the jury is going like oh okay well at this point he was just putting her out of her her misery though right it's like <laughs> that does seems like so he gets done he wraps up the judge turns to laura linney and says oh, so you want to do your opening statement and she's like the pass pass <laughs> oh, yeah. she's got the oh fuck face of somebody who <laughs> probably should have, should have done a bit more than take the priest at their word on the whole demon thing <laughs> right yeah exactly a little <laughs> added bonus content here about how evil this movie is that photo that they show it's a fake photo of the last photo yeah. of the true girl it's based mm. on which means they saw the last photo of a girl who was beaten to death by her priest and family. And they were like, oh, oh, we should make one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yes. right. I also, I love this tiny little moment, right? After she says to the judge, like, actually, I want to do my opening statement after the defense has already done their presentation or whatever. And they're like, yeah, sure, it's a movie. You can do that. She turns to the priest and she says, don't worry. That was my plan all along. I meant to do that. That was <laughs> <It's just> amazing. <laughs> It's such a ridiculous thing for the lawyer to say to her client. <laughs> Terrible. Don't worry. It's all part of my plan for them to just hear his side of things for <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. most of it. <laughs> all right. So now the uh, the prosecutor is going to bring Edith to the stand. She's the family doctor. Yeah. And we, we learn in this scene that Laura Linney can object like a motherfucker, right? Yeah, I mean, so Edith is not only the family doctor, she's also Emily's pen pal. Uh, so that's that's sweet. Weird. Uh, that uh, Emily was writing to her, her doctor when she went to, when we went to college, like all good college kids do. Yeah, what? <laughs> the family doctor? So she says, well, yeah, she wrote to me to tell me about this boy she met at a dance. She didn't want to tell her mom because her mom didn't approve of dancing. And I'm like, okay, well, then you're automatically guilty of torturing your kid to death, right? <laughs> right. There's no question. That's it. You could have rested. You could have been like, yeah, hey, prosecution. All right. All right, well, they're, they're anti-dancing, so can't be the good guys in a movie. Yeah, my closing statement is, do you think a lady who's anti-dancing didn't beat her kid to death? <laughs> <laughs> no, y'all think she beat her kid to death? It's because she did. It's because she did. Yeah, and then so we we flash back. So, like, the, the doctor apparently, like, also got a call from her one time at the middle of the night down a, from a payphone where she was freaking out and having like a mental breakdown or something. Literally a mental breakdown. She was mm. actually having a literal breakdown. Yeah. And this is, you know, people often say like, what's the harm of religion? What's the harm of religion? And isn't this a perfect example of yes. one of the unexpected oh, harms yeah. of religion, right? Because as a doctor, if someone calls you and says, I'm chock block full of demons, the DSM doesn't allow you to acknowledge religious phenomenon as part of it. So you have to be like, 
Oh, fuck. Are you sure you're not chock full of lizards? Because if you're chock full of lizards, I have a medication to put you on, right? Yeah. This, this real life girl was experiencing her first psychotic symptoms. But because we have an entire society built around pretending her particular psychosis is real, no one in her life could be like, oh, don't worry. That's definitely not real. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So so this testimony doodly does us back to her first like psychotic episode or first epileptic seizure, whatever it was. Right. Because we never really drilled down is exactly what this is. So she wakes up in the middle of the night, 3 a.m. Exactly. She walks out into the hallway. We get the pop scare wind closing the door, <laughs> followed by the pop scare wind opening the door. I just okay, fuck off, guys. Come on. We know you got nothing. I mean, even if you have good stuff, you can't do two pop scares in a row. We're already ready for it now. Right. But outside, she found, you know, the inside of a schizophrenic's eyeballs. The, like This is so very clearly like a person having a seizure but as imagined through a you know grindhouse horror movie director. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It could not be clearer. Absolutely. And again, this is very obviously, as Marsh mentioned, like the skeptic was like, oh, maybe she could get like sunk into her bed and have a seizure. And the idiot director was like, yeah, that's spooky ghost stuff. And he was like, yeah, spooky ghost stuff. Or what happens to people when they have epilepsy and seizures? <laughs> what? <laughs> right. No, spooky, so spooky ghost. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it moves her pen cup. Oh, her haunted pencils. Yeah, she, she looked across and her pencils are haunted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, right, yeah, because there's no scientific explanation for our pencils falling over when you're having an <laughs> epileptic seizure. Uh, so <laughs> Look, I might have been using every muscle in my body to spend my spine backwards, but I know those pencils were firmly in their cup. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah, and this is this is one of the first of many times I wrote in my notes. This movie is going to take seriously a young woman's epileptic hallucinations as a way of blaming them for her own brutal death, isn't it? And I've got to do a comedy show about this. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yep, it's tough one. All right, so the, the best thing to do is power through, Marsh. Okay, <laughs> so then we, we get a neurologist on the stand. So you know, bullshit elitist here. This is a person who examined her and is an expert, and he's like. Yeah, you know, at first we thought she'd just taken drugs because, you know, college kid that wasn't allowed to dance that day. They tend to do that. But no, no, it was it was epilepsy. We checked. Right. It, we, we found exactly what you'd find if it was epilepsy. And they were like, oh, OK. And then what happened? And he was like, oh, well, she she stopped doing the medicine stuff and went with magic. And now we're here figuring out who murdered her. I know <laughs> if you guys would like me to just wrap this thing up for you. <laughs> Yeah, right, Laura Lynn. He's like, objection. He's speculating. And the judge is like, on the thing, he's an expert. That's why he's here to speculate on that. But in fairness, he was speculating because he cannot say with 100% certainty it absolutely was epilepsy. And ergo, a priest telling her to come off her meds is absolutely fine. That is that is Laura Linney's objection here. Yeah. Are you certain it was epilepsy? Well, obviously not certain certain because there's no such thing as, well, there we go, then demons. Right, <laughs> right. No, her entire fucking cross-examination was, well, wait a minute, didn't she also do non-epileptic things? <laughs> well, yeah, like she, she went and got groceries. That's not very epileptic at all, is it? The defense... Rests. Wait, no, no, I don't. I just want to I, I, I haven't done my opening yet. I forgot. I did a good job. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So we, we wrap up there, and now we get uh, Laura visiting father murderer, at, at father antagonist in the jail again. Yeah, and he opens very strongly. He's like, hey, uh, before we get started with a little wrap-up of the day, you should know that we're both being attacked by demons. And she's like, <laughs> boo, not great, not great. When someone says that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a series of not great things. Because he says, look, before we carry on, there's something I should have told you before I let you take the case. Not a good thing to say midway through the case as you talk to a lawyer. <laughs> he then follows up with, I believe in spooky ghosts. Not much better than that. And then it's, and you're being attacked. Oh God, this is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He says, there are dark, powerful forces surrounding this trial. And I want her to be like, oh dude, we already know you work for the Catholic Church. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, I did. They, they hired me. Yeah. <laughs> And he tells her, you know, demons exist, whether you believe in them or not, which is a really stupid point because it's equally true to say of anything. You know, space pelicans exist, whether you believe in them or not. It's just as relevant a thing to right, say. Right, yeah, exactly. That was never a contingency. Well, what's great is it's such a wonderful bastardization of skepticism, right? Because that that we've all heard, like, science works whether or not you believe in it. 
but that's not true of demons. No, right. it's not. I, I will never be attacked by a demon. <laughs> yeah, no, right, right. 100% certainty on that one. And Laura Linney's like, yeah, uh, I'm uh, right. I'm being attacked by demons. Can we talk about law shit instead? And he's like, yeah, okay. He's, she's like, uh, okay, what I need from you is a like a good opening line that would lead us into another doodly do, preferably one that is chronologically next to the previous doodly do. <laughs> oh, this one, it frustrated me so much, this one, because he starts giving her Emily's medical history and... Why is she, the lawyer, getting Emily's medical history from the delusional priest who killed her? This is not how (laughs) that is meant to work. And there's also, there's a lovely line that she tells him as well. She says, the prosecutor is using the medical aspects of this case as ammunition. So yeah, those medical aspects being, you killed a girl who was suffering from various forms of mental illness. That's (laughs) the medical aspects of this. Right. So it turns out they have reality on their side. So we should be prepared... (laughs) To counter that. The good news is you're religious, so we have a head start. <laughs> and this reminded me so much of something from my own life. So way back when I was trying to be an actor, and Noah, you can cut this if this isn't funny or not relevant to the movie. Way back when I was trying to be an actor, right? I got cast in a TV pilot called The Real Scooby-Doo, right? And what they wanted is they wanted a skeptic and then like believers and a bunch of other people, people from all walks of life. And a dog. But when they, and a dog, right, And a dog, right. But then when they hired, they didn't actually want a real skeptic. They wanted someone who would be like, I've never seen a ghost. There one is. I believe now. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I got fired on the very first day of shooting the pilot because they gathered us all together and they were like, so do you think there are any ghosts in the house? And I was like, there absolutely aren't any ghosts in the house because nothing happens when you die. Imagine the consequences of us believing that ghosts were real or even possible. And then there was like a four minute pause while I realized I was fired. And this is the lawyer version of that. Yep. (laughs) This is the got sent home at lunch and we're asked not to have crafty of lawyer (laughs) conversations. All right. So from there, we flash back to Emily insaning out of a window in a mental hospital somewhere. Yeah. So like she's looking out the window and and it's, there's lightning going on and she sees a demon face in the lightning mm-hmm. and falls into a seizure because the lightning is flashing lights and she's epileptic, arguably. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes a lot of fucking sense. But of course, again, that's something that the skeptic put into the movie, right? It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. right. Because that would be a a trigger for that. But then the director's like, yeah, but I bet if I put a demon face on it, then people would think it was because of the demon face. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Okay, so now we've got Laura Linney interviewing Emily's boyfriend, and he's going to talk us through another uh, doodly-do. This will be the first time we see her just go off completely, like, um, all the way crazy, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, this is the one where she runs into the church. And, like, here's the thing. The rules of your own thing are that demons can't get you in your magic house, right? Mm-hmm. What, that should have been the the clue to Emily that the thing you're seeing is not real, right? If your kryptonite doesn't work on Superman, he's not fucking Superman, Emily. Go. Or it's not kryptonite. Yeah, one or the other. Yeah, right. take your medication. <laughs> also, so I just want to point out the laziness of this goddamn sequence, right? Because we just keep, the, it keeps giving us the same goddamn pop scare over and over again. Jennifer Carpenter, the the the, the actor is really good at the screamy things. Yeah. Like, I get why they wanted to have her do that a lot, but it's just the same fucking... Every, she looks at somebody's face and they're all monstery. Ah! Oh, that person also all monstery. Ah! Just over and over again, like 11 times. Yeah, yeah, it gets so boring. It's like there's a couple in the rain. Oh, yep, they've got the Edvard Munch scream face. She gets... <laughs> yep, in the, the, I actually wrote my notes. Oh, there's two old ladies in, in the front pew of the chapel there. I wonder if when she gets to them, their faces will change to evil. And there it is. Their face yeah. changed to evil. <laughs> right. See, I really wanted one guy not to turn evil. Like a couple <laughs> monk faces, old ladies, monk faces, turns to a janitor. He's just like, hello. And she's like, okay, I guess the demon. I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> demons, uh, demons can't get him. <laughs> so, as, but as she's walking around seeing all these monsters, her boyfriend sees her, right? And follows her into this church. And when he comes in, she's like all bent over backwards. Like she's dodging demonic matrix bullets. Or something. <laughs> yeah. And the boyfriend has such a weird reaction to this, right? He's like, yeah, no, she's dodging Matrix bullets, but um, I'm a Christian now. <laughs> yeah. 
He says, uh, I never knew how dead I was until I met her, which is such a weird line. And also <laughs> such a self-centered way to talk about your dead ex-girlfriend. Yeah, <laughs> no shit. Yeah. You could uh, stick to talking about her. She's the one who died. We're at her murder <laughs> trial. I Don't get me wrong. I'm really excited about your religious journey in college, but I just want to focus <laughs> on Emily for the moment. All right, so so then we so Laura Linney's at a bar again because she's a lawyer, and and this is when she hears on the news that James Van Hopper, the murderer, has struck again. Damn, she really needed to give that guy a more severe outro interview, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> and what did we say? More murdering? No, no James, I said, I said no, no more murdering. <laughs> no more. <laughs> it's such a weird thing for the film to do at this point because. Earlier in the film, she's talking to these older lawyers who were like, we were going to fry him until you'd convince us not to. So, like, they were the good guys and she's the bad guy now? Like, what are you doing? What was the point in this movie? Right, exactly. So, yeah, so but she goes into the bathroom. She's like, oh, what am I doing with my life? I'm helping the murderers. And then a lady walks out of the bathroom stall. Pop scare. It's the best. It's just like (laughs) a lady walks out of the bathroom. She might as well turn to her and be like, was that just a pop scare in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> I was taking a shit. Me being done taking a shit is a pop scare in your life. <laughs> it was a bummer. Your movie sucks. <laughs> so yeah, well, right. So then the movie starts desperately going around looking for something demonic to happen again, right? So it, it's like middle of the night. It's 3 a.m. Because, you know, demons. Yep, 3 a.m. So it's it's time for another visit from the ghost of criminal negligence past. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so like she wakes up at 3 a.m. and she's just walking around looking for a pop scare, you know. But the pop scare here is I can smell burning, but it's really hard to silently act I can smell burning in a spooky <laughs> way. It just doesn't come across as intimidating. No, it comes across as like a, a Bugs Bunny falling for the trap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely the where has my cat pooped <laughs> performance. <laughs> Oh God, don't say that. I've I've had a lot of problems with my new cat and that is a very triggering <laughs> sentence for you to say. This, this house has secret shits all over the place and I've not found them all yet. So yeah, but but then eventually like her door blows open because they had to do something to end this fucking scene <laughs> and then a glass breaks. She breaks a glass. Ooh, scary. But she breaks the glass because the door opens and she forgets how countertops work and right. just drops the glass straight onto the floor. <laughs> it's like, this isn't a scare. You just dropped a glass. <laughs> It's so fucking stupid. And like the, the soundtrack seems embarrassed to have gotten so worked up over this, right? <laughs> it's just the soundtrack uh, keeps swelling strings going like, oh, is she going back to bed? Are you sure nothing? Is something creepy going to happen while she's in the bed? No. Why am I even here? <laughs> this movie couldn't have been sillier if we had just watched her clean up the glass two straight. <laughs> Whoa. Well, the thing is, she was barefoot and I thought, oh, she's going to cut her foot on the glass. That's why we've seen the glass smash onto the floor. Mm-hmm. Nope, not nope. nothing nope. of that. Nope. The other thing is she's shocked because the, the kitchen clock has stopped as well, but it stopped eight seconds to 3 a.m., not at 3 a.m. So I guess the demon kind of entered via the kitchen and t- it took eight seconds to get from right. there to okay, the bedroom. Was, oh, right. God, this, is, yeah. this movie really adds up when you think about it. <laughs> you got to love that demon sitting in the kitchen. He accidentally stops the clock early. Ah, oh, fuck, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Or maybe he was, he does that thing with digital clocks where you're trying to set it and you go one minute over where you want to get to. It's oh, oh, yeah, right. around 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's close enough. It's close enough. Yeah, Never mind. Uh, so meanwhile, so the movie's like, okay, so there was not a, I'm sure there was going to be a pop scare there. What about with the priest? Is there a pop scare going on with the priest? Right. So we cut over to the jail where there are demons whispering at him. Right. Which the movie is going to use as proof that he was in the right but man accused of negligent homicide his voices in his head is not the hero that isn't the no of your story no <laughs> it might be a good insanity defense i don't know but it's certainly not heroic but he says magic words mm-hmm. and so the angels come and like fucking bully the demons away yeah <laughs> i was really hoping we'd get a flash cut to that right just michael showing up sorry guys he said the magic words we oh, gotta, yeah, you gotta leave, fucck- stop whispering at him <laughs> stop guys guys, <laughs> guys. angelic librarian or something <laughs> yeah so all right well apparently this movie needs a minute to think of something creepy that could happen to its characters so we're gonna give it a brainstorming break but we'll be back soon with even more of the exorcism of emily rose Hello, hello. Dave Scrumpson. Nice to meet you. Eli, 
what are you doing in my room? Oh, hey, Noah, I was just trying on my new personality, Dave Scrumpson. Wait, I, I know I'm going to regret asking this, but why? Uh, I don't know. It's just so much of my identity is wrapped up in my hair. Now that I'm losing it, I kind of feel like I need a whole new personality, you know? Well, why don't you just try Keeps? The innermost and strongest structure or central tower of a medieval castle? No, not at all. With Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get hair loss medication delivered right to your home. They make it easy and deliver your medication every three months so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor visits. Wait, I can get hair loss medication online? That sounds fishy. It's not. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products out there. You may have tried them before, but probably never for this price. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to Keeps.com slash awful to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash awful. Thanks, Noah. <laughs> so long, Dave Scrumpskin. Hello, Matilda Marshbranken. Well, so now why are you going to be her? It's just fun. Okay. Demons, come forth. Uh, yes, Lord Satan? We have a new mission. I need five of you to join me in a possession. Ooh, who is our victim? The president? Or, or the prime minister? Better. It's a relatively religious girl in the middle of nowhere. Um, a, a, a relatively religious girl? In the middle of nowhere, yep. We're gonna just Shock her full of demons. Cool, cool. Uh, don't take this the wrong way, Satan, but, uh, what's the point? Yeah, yeah, like, what, what is the point? I'm sorry, what do you mean, what's the point? We're gonna, like, we're gonna make her eat bugs and scratch people. And right, right, yeah, bend. That, that sounds fun. Don't get me wrong, that sounds fun, but won't possessing her make everyone around her know that demons are real and thus, you know, make them more religious? Yeah, it, it seems like it kind of sabotages the long-term goal. What? No, no, it'll, it'll, no, it'll be like super spooky. Super spooky. Uh, Satan, can I speak honestly? Well, of course. Are you sure you don't want to just grab a girl body so you can do show tunes? Oh, yeah, like we've all heard you practicing "I Feel Pretty" the last couple of weeks. Wait, you guys heard that? Very much. Yeah, of the screams of damned, yeah. <sighs> All right, don't tell anybody, and I'll let you guys pick two Supreme Court justices. Deal. Brilliant. <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. We're going to open this scene back up in the courtroom, and, and we have the, like, weirdly obligatory courtroom defense attorney showing up late scene. Yeah. I don't know why this has to be in every goddamn courtroom <laughs> movie, but it's this is this is it. We know why it's in this one, though. She's late because the demons keep turning off her alarm clock at three o'clock in yeah. the morning. Like, so. <laughs> right, yeah. So, all right, so now the prosecutor is going to bring on another one of his bullshit experts, right? And he's going to explain how Emily Rose died, which is starving and then some. And by the way, the movie will not refute this. I kept waiting for them to be like, oh, she didn't die from starvation. She died from the demon that burst out of her butthole. No, this movie will be like, I mean, she did starve to death. That is true. We're not yeah. going to refute that one. The closest it gets refuting it is saying the demon made her starve to death by puttering off her food and refusing to let her eat. But yeah, yeah you still, you starved her to death. You starved this girl to death. This is, right. this is the truth of this story. Well, and, and we should be clear by about how much this movie diverges from its source material. So it's way, way off from the source material, obviously. But you know, in, in, in this movie, it may have been a fucking demon. <laughs> but also, like, I want to be clear on this one. In the real story, the priest starved her to death. Yes. The fasting was part of the exorcism. Yes. The movie had to take that out because they're like, there's no fucking way we can pretend he's the good guy then. But just so so we're clear, in the real story, the fucking priest also starved her. It wasn't that she was unable to eat. No, it wasn't. And by the way, the doctor refutes this because we live in reality. They were like, well, what would you have done, doctor? And he was like, well, I would have used medicine to make sure she got enough nutrition so she didn't die. And everyone in the courtroom is like, oh, fuck, you can do that, can't you? You can. <laughs> but, but the movie wants, he, he mentions electroshock therapy and the movie wants them to be like, shock therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is stupid because no, he fucking wouldn't have. He would have forced better. And, and, and that's like, you know, that's what he says. Like, so 
the prosecutor is like, so what you're saying is she could have been both epileptic and psychotic. And he's like, well, that's more fucking likely than possessed by a goddamn demon, isn't it? And everybody's like, yeah, that's, that's true. There's like, there is a really sneaky thing the film does here as well, because they they talk about, I think it's like epileptic psychosis or something like that is, the, is a term specifically they use, which isn't itself a name for diagnosis, which they pick up on later and say, mm-hmm. well, that's not even a real diagnosis. It's like, right, no, she was epileptic and psychotic. He's put the two things together. Why would this film have to have the, the medical doctor invent a name for the diagnosis rather than just give her two separate diagnoses? It's so we can say, well, you see, he's making stuff up. Right. Because th- we also have Laura Linney, the lawyer, playing the same card she did earlier, which is, can you be 100% sure she would have got better? So, no, I'm like 99% sure that if you'd have fed her, she wouldn't have starved to death. But I guess I can't be 100% <laughs> sure of that. <laughs> the defense rests. Yeah, exactly. right. I right. win. Yeah. Beep, 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 beep. Please turn the boombox off, counselor. <laughs> All right. And just one other thing about the ECT. She asks him about the ECT and she sweeps to the jury, like, huh? Huh? He would electrocute her. That's not good. But like, they put you to sleep for electroshock therapy now. It's not a it's not a thing. You just wake up with way less mental illness than you went to sleep with a lot of the time. <laughs> Look, regardless, she's dead. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right so that's the alternative yeah it's for like for fuck's sake they're making out the doctor's a bad guy because he'd give her ect against her will rather than the good guy who's the priest who killed her by telling her she was possessed and shouldn't take her meds and tortured <laughs> her to death like i'm sorry but like this we should point out like that this woman's knees were broken when she when she died both knees were broken from like being on their knees constantly praying and shit so you got to imagine that like that's at least as bad as even movie electroshock therapy, right? Yeah. Well, that's true if you believe that's how she broke her knees, Noah, because we're going to see some pretty compelling evidence later <laughs> oh, to see God. another reason, another way she could have <laughs> broken her knees. Well, as though the movie wants to say, like, see, there's a lot of different ways you could break knees. Just, yeah, the knees yeah. just get broke sometimes. You know, who, who's to say how it happened? Oh, my God. Yeah. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so the prosecution rests, and Laura Linney goes up to the antagonist, the, the priest, and she goes, hey, I am super sorry I was late this morning. He's like, no, it's cool. You were attacked by demons in the middle of the night, right? And she goes, what? no, I was, no. And just on the prosecution resting at, the, at this point, like they started very pointedly, they started at 9.45 this morning because she was 45 minutes late or 50 minutes late, rather. They did what amounted to about 10 minutes of testimony and now they, they're recessed for the rest of the day. Is that normal? For the rest of the day, day yeah. yeah. <laughs> you only want to do court and snack, snack-sized <laughs> pieces. And by the way, when he says like, oh, you're under attack by demons because they don't, I want to know if the forces of darkness are helping her opponent, the protagonist, like <laughs> slipping fives into his pants pocket, giving him a back <laughs> rub while he sleeps at 3 a.m. Yeah, so he leaves. She turns to her nameless assistant, who I don't think we've met before, but will be a character from now on. And she says, man, we really need to find a doctor who will lie and say that this was demon magic and not epilepsy. He's like, yeah, it's going to be tricky. Oh, God, that upset me so much. She's like, yeah, if we can't find a doctor who will misdiagnose this dead girl, we're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> oh, then you're already in trouble, lady. Okay, so. All right, but now it's time to get some serious lawyer undone. She's broke out the yellow paper once more, this time to study demonic possession. Yeah, and she says to her assistant, she's like, yeah, I've read lots of books about demons. None of them are true. Is that an issue? <laughs> no, the, the demons don't ever turn out to be real. Well, and the assistant's like, oh, look at this. Back when we believed the stuff we're trying to prove, we burned women at the stake for having cats. <laughs> Neat, huh? She's like, okay, we could use that. She did have cats. Had <laughs> cats. <laughs> oh, God. There's a really uncomfortable line from the assistant as well, where uh, she says, you know, I'm reading this book about possession in the third world. He says, of course, people there are still primitive and superstitious. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Laura Linney's like, hey, they could be superstitious or maybe demons love Somalia. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But again, I I just correct me if I'm wrong here. She decides that her position as a lawyer is to make a positive case for the existence of demons. Yeah, no, the, the, the exact words is that she wants to validate possession. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, which I mean, in fair, if you're going to try and validate possession in court of law, you can do that because, you know, possession's nine-tenths of the law. Ah. Boom. 
<laughs> so, oh. Yeah, but so but she comes across this book and it's one of those dumbass fucking books that somebody on Be Reasonable told Marsh to read. <laughs> right? It's the, one of these like anthropologists, but maybe there are demons kind of books. She's like, let's bring this idiot on. And they're like, yeah, okay. All right. Well, she yeah, was in yeah. the expanse. Well, oh, this, this, this annoyed me as well because she says, you know, this person, you know, she uh, uh, approaches the subject of possession from a scientific perspective and doesn't try to debunk it. And it's like, right, yeah. And you can do that. But the point is, you know, I know people who do that, but the point is when you do that, the stuff debunks itself. When you approach right. it scientifically and don't go looking to debunk it, but just go honestly into it, it debunks itself. If you're doing it correctly, yes, exactly, because it doesn't exist, right? There's a moment where she's like, you know, she's like, okay, but what if possession is real to the assistant? And the assistant is like, yeah, but it's not, though. It, <laughs> it isn't. But yeah, but what if it was? Okay, we can make a movie, I guess, about it. <laughs> yeah, and she's basically at the point where it's like, well, there's nothing in the rule book that says a lawyer can't blame demons. So I guess <laughs> after that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, okay, so we're back in court. It's time for her belated opening statement. She says, hey, you know, it is not illegal to believe in demons. It's still illegal to kill teenagers, though. Shit. Uh, <laughs> Damn. Not and as good as I thought. I'm sorry. I have to point this out. She opens with her name. She's like, hello, my name is Aaron. Great lawyering. Fantastic. How are you today? <laughs> Stupid. You're a jury. Never mind. At this point, I wrote in my notes, this is a brilliant strategy. Get yourself disbarred and get your client a mistrial. It can't fail. <laughs> And she she argues that you don't have to believe that demons exist to believe that people are correct when they think demons exist. Yeah, wait, what? She's trying to riff for him off a murder charge. You know, the victim yeah, of family, yes. they sincerely <laughs> believe she wasn't starving to death. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and then she presents the argument that like, hey, medicine hadn't worked yet. So fuck it. Medicine had its chance. Reality <laughs> had its chance to fix her. Like, keep in mind, <laughs> the argument that she's using would validate any type of quack medicine ever imagined. Right? Because mm -hmm. she's saying, well, it's what they believed, and that's it's not illegal to believe that. Hey, it's not illegal to believe that there's a demon inside a marsh. There, It's illegal for me to stab the fucking thing out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. So we're we're doing a series of doodly doos and, and we just keep coming back to different people, different ones of her witnesses that are telling the story, starting with the boyfriend who I, I love. This is telling the story about how they were just completely platonically fully dressed sleeping together at college when she had a epileptic seizure. <laughs> it's like this isn't even a true part of the story, guys. You can <laughs> they could have just been friend snuggles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so she has this seizure. He takes her back home, right, from the college. And then we have dad on the stand talking about how, like, all the doctors came in and all the king's horses and all the king's men, no good, didn't do anything. Yeah, and it's got this whole bit where he's, he's talking about the time that she was eating spiders and cockroaches. Mm -hmm. And, like, Ugh. those are real things that happened with the real victim, Annalise Michelle, but they're signs that she needed a doctor and not a priest. Those are really clear signs of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so and and I, I I think that is such a telling moment, right? They have the dad on the stand, and he's like, you know, we had tried medicine and it wasn't making her any better, so we called the priest. And I'm like, huh? It's almost like having an alternative to real truth is just bad from the get go, <laughs> right? Right? Like this is inevitable. This is fucking inevitable because first of all, you know, this all happened in the '70s or whatever where, where, where this happened. You know, the pharmacological possibilities for a psychiatrist w weren't as good as they are now. And even now they're far from fucking perfect. So yeah, sometimes the shit doesn't work. Sometimes like the first medicine doesn't do everything that you want it to do or has side effects that you weren't expecting. Like this is how that kind of shit works and it has to work. But when you've got somebody off in the back standing there going like, all right, anytime you want to give up on that, I'm ready with my fucking anti-demon stick over here. That's right. inevitably going to lead to people not getting the treatment they need. Right. Yeah. Especially when they're in direct competition, right? Yeah. Because- one of those has to be like, oh, no, that thing isn't real. So when you switch over to anti-demon sticks, you have to admit that demons are real. And that causes a problem for further medical treatment. Right. Especially when the, the priest is very specifically telling you that the medication you're taking is preventing the exorcism from working as well. <laughs> right, it was just an argument that they make in this. Yeah, it's un-fucking-believable. Mm. But oh, and, and of course, during this flashback, this is where we see the 
knee abuse that Marsh was discussing. Yeah, where she's throwing herself down onto her knees and that explains why her knees were, were so fucked. And the, the thing to bear in mind as well, the film deviates from reality on another key point here. In reality, the parents were also on trial. So this would have been testimony from one of the accused saying, no, we didn't break her knees. She broke her own knees. We, you can believe her. Right, yeah, right. 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 Yeah, exactly. Right. You can watch this film and think, ooh, scary, demonic possession, spooky. She's eating insects. She's throwing herself around. She's, but she's moving in weirdly demonic ways. Or you can watch it and realize this is the actual exploitation of a genuine real life story of a seriously ill girl who died as a result of the treatment she was getting. And it's, this is where the film becomes a horror film where you're like, oh, fuck, they are misusing the source material this viciously. Right. Yeah. You, you know what else looks spooky? Someone having a heart attack. You put strings behind that. It also looks like demonic possession. Yeah. It doesn't mean you shouldn't give them an aspirin and some of those paddles. Right. Well, <laughs> well, yeah. So, and this is the part in the flashback where, like, the priest shows up and starts talking to her in Latin, and she talks back in demon voice. So, obviously, totally possessed. And so, the flashback ends. Yeah. So, like, he's talking in Latin. She's shouting back in Latin. It's like, oh, how does she do that? I mean, either this is a flashback and it didn't happen, or she was Catholic in the 1970s when uh, masses were still conducted in Latin. <laughs> right. Or she was possessed by a demon. And guess which fucking one the film makes it out to be a symptom of. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah. And keeping in mind also that she would have gone to Catholic schools where you had to learn Latin as it, like, it was mm -hmm. a required course. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, but so the flashback wraps up and we get back to our protagonist who, who cross examines and he goes like, uh, so uh, father of the deceased, are you a religious nut? And dad's like, yep, sure am. <laughs> sure am. Gave the priest my daughter. Just gave him to him. Yeah. Yeah. He says, so uh, you trusted him? And he said, yeah, he's our parish priest. And the prosecutor says, fair enough. And, you know, this is why it's a bad thing that religion just gets a pass mm -hmm. because a guy who just happened to be assigned to your town gets an automatic default amount of your respect and trust. Yeah, right, right. Especially since he was assigned there because he was raping kids in some other town. Yeah. Mm. And he said, so the prosecutor's like, OK, so um, here I got two books here. One's the Bible. The other is the DSM. Which are you more familiar with? <laughs> when you're trying to assess things, right? Because he, he basically he says is the DSM, the demonic satanic manual. <laughs> <Is it that normal>? <laughs> <laughs> right. He goes, he, he says to the dad, he's like, so now <clears throat> just objectively taking your daughter out of it for a second. Would you say that bug eating is a non psychotic thing to do? And the dad's like, well, shit, now that you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, so now it's time for us to hear from their pseudoscience anthropologist. Yeah. Right? The, the, the chick from The Expanse that explains how it could be demons, though. Yeah. And this, this is where I would say this movie crosses the line from like, hey, this is really exploitive to use this sick girl story to like, dangerous to mm -hmm. like you shouldn't be able to buy it on iTunes level dangerous yeah. right because this woman's point is oh let me explain I can see you all think that she was sick no the medication made her worse that's why the exorcism didn't work because it blocked her psychic powers which is the reason she had demons in the first place and thus the reason that she died mm -hmm. yeah right the, she, the, the medicine killed her because it kept the priest from being able to get all the demons out yeah, she says, like, well, I believe that Emily was a hypersensitive, the kind of person that demons are really attracted to. You know, demons uh, tend to have a very specific porn profile or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, to prosecutor slash protagonist's credit, he's like, uh, excuse me, could you join me at the bench for a whisper fight? <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, are you just going to let this lady do her Be Reasonable episode on the stand? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was so, so upsetting. You know, this whole thing about her being a hypersensitive and was unusually connected to the separate reality. This is someone who's meant to be the expert who's claiming that some people just have visions of the future and can see the dead. And the thing is, I know people who've spent their lives and their research careers doing almost exactly the research she's meant to have been doing, you know, scientifically evaluating reports of possessions and trying to understand what's going on there. And their take home message isn't, uh, to just I guess some people are just more susceptible to demons than others. <laughs> right? Then, huh? Yes. <laughs> Funny that. 
Yeah, right. Like if you went around and studied this and found that, huh, it's weird how these always seem to match the cultural expectations. Your fucking takeaway couldn't possibly be. So it must be real demons. Only they're super regional. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. They seek out people who know the culture because yeah. you know, they just like to get along with their own. You know, look, all I'm saying is it's perfectly reasonable to preserve our culture and heritage and other people have their culture and heritage. And you don't go outside your own is all I'm saying. It's perfectly reasonable. <laughs> This is, being on this American show is rubbing off on you, Marsh. Okay, so <laughs> all right, so yeah, but the but but the prosecutor objects right in the middle of this testimony. He's like, "Objection, Your Honor!" And the judge is like, "I yeah, I I get it, I get it, but you technically still have to state a, a grounds." And he goes, "Just it's bullshit, right?" Yeah. Right. He goes, "How about on on the grounds of this is fucking silly?" So she's like, "Oh yeah, it is. Come to come to the bench and and let's have our little whisper fight." So they have their little whisper fight, and ultimately the judge is just like, you know, we already did medicine. Let's also <laughs> do bullshit, right? Okay. Yeah. The, the judge is like, look, we've had a lot of experts say this wasn't magic, so it's only fair that we hear from <laughs> someone who says it was magic. I was appointed by Mitch McConnell, and I'll be here for 50 years. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. So, so then we wrap up the courtroom scene. Uh, we get her sitting outside the courthouse. When suddenly nameless assistant shows up with some good news, he did find a doctor with no morals that'll testify that this was genuine demon possession. It turns out, as a matter of fact, this doctor was an eyewitness to the exorcism. Oh, and the movie wants us to think like, oh, this is their ace in the hole. But in a real legal case, it'd just be like, oh, cool. An Another person who is guilty of negligent <laughs> yes. homicide. Right. Yes. So, oh, I see. So this medical expert is disqualified from offering his medical testimony then. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So he's like, yeah, he got in touch with us and he's willing to testify. So first, Laura Linney's got to go and like bitch out Father Moore for not telling her about the doctor. And he's like, right. But I we had a pinky swear. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And her response to this is to look at him like, wow, you're so honorable, Father. It's like, no, you are withholding <laughs> vital evidence in a fucking negligent homicide trial. Yes. Do you want to go to jail? Right. Well, and then keep in mind again, like Eli said, this is a co-conspirator. Like you're 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 protecting a felon. This is a different crime you're committing. It's not honorable. Yeah, and the thing is as well, like him withholding evidence, this isn't the only piece of evidence he withhold. He has t at least two further pieces of evidence he yep. just sprinkles throughout the trial. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, and just for the sake of like better timing for the story. Yeah. So, okay. So he, so we go to the park where um, Laura Linney meets Dr. Cartwright, the doctor that assisted in the exorcism. And so once again, the movie's like so desperate to have a pop scare, like birds suddenly fly off and, and, and the characters look at him like, oh, does that mean a monster's coming? Is that, is that a nothing? Nothing. Okay, That's nothing. All right. Part of the horror movie? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like the doctor looks at the pigeons like he's he's waiting for it to do the pop scare. So he's, like, he's, sort of, he's sort of trying to focus in a little bit to see if there's any, any hint of a pop scare. No. Mm, mm. All right. Okay, all right. okay so, we'll carry yeah. on. <laughs> Yeah, so the doctor explains, like, you know, I she was no schizophrenic. She was no epileptic. They do this bullshit thing where he says, no, no, she couldn't have had a mental illness because when she wasn't being all crazy, she knew that sometimes she was all crazy. Yeah. What the fuck is that? Yeah, the movie literally self-summarizes by going, crazy people don't know they're crazy. Like, that's a real medical fact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What? Yeah, that, that, that's not how that works. That is not remotely how that works. <laughs> no. Jesus. Yeah. So, but he explains all of this. He's like, I was there to help. And I, I, I can tell you for sure that she had no mental illness. I am an expert. And I'm like, mm, those two statements can't be both true. <laughs> and she says, and you'll testify to all of this in court. He says, yes, I promise not to get killed by monsters or kill myself before I can testify <laughs> in trial. Cross my heart, hope that uh, cross would just cross my heart. Just cross my heart. Here's a tape player. <laughs> yep. Here, here, have a plot device. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need this to cue a doodly do later. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so she goes to the jail to tell Father Moore all the good news about Dr. Cartwright and how he's going to testify now. But he's pissed off, right? Because he's like, hey, you know, I don't care about my own innocence or anything. 
I care about telling Emily's story and endangering more people with mental illnesses, right? It's yeah. in the fucking title of the movie. Yeah, he's just like, I just need to get on the stand and share the dangerous delusion that I validated. That'll solve everything. <laughs> That'll fix everything for everyone. Trust me, they'll get it. Yeah. To which she responds, I found a locket with my initials <laughs> outside. Well, yeah, okay. So <laughs> so he says, he, you know, he says, she's like, yeah, you know, I, they, the archdiocese doesn't want you to testify. And I, you know, but fuck it. <laughs> fuck it. They're just paying my bills. That's all. And he says, oh, by the way, have you thought any more about the crazy ranting shit I was doing about you being attacked by demons? And she's like, yeah, sure have. When you <laughs> when you tell people that you're they're being attacked by demons, they always think about it later. Um, <laughs> but that's because she's persuaded now. She's starting to be persuaded. And just like step back from this movie for one second, right? The priest meets a, a young mentally ill girl, tells her to stop her meds, starves her, causes her death and then persuades his lawyer to believe his delusions as well. Like in any other film, he is a dangerous psychopath. Right. He's like Hannibal Lecter levels of psychopath. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like he needs to be locked up by the end yeah. of this. Right. And the timeline of this movie, according to this movie, right, with the bullshit is that Jesus dropped by a locket with her initials on it to help her with the demon attacks during her court case. Yeah, right. So she tells him this story. She's like, yeah, I've been thinking about what you said. And I, the other day I was out for a walk and I found this locket that had my initials on it. What are the odds? And I'm like, well, they're not worse than one in 17,576. <laughs> and, and that's like, that would be if all the letters were evenly distributed. So it's not it's just, uh, but but it, it, enough so that no, the fuck it didn't, right? That didn't happen. Yeah, and it, it didn't happen. It, it did not happen in real life. This locket is just a, a confection to try and force the point because yeah. the actual story is so bad. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And this is actually, you know, one in 17,000 or no, it's still too much of a coincidence to actually happen because there is no God. So yeah, so she tells him, like, she doesn't give a fuck what the archdiocese says. If he wants to testify, you know, he can testify even if he does make their vicarious cannibal death cult sound weird. <laughs> and and that archdiocese line I love as well, because he says the archdiocese doesn't want you to testify. It's like, right. And, you know, the clown union wasn't best pleased about their link to John Wayne Gacy either. Like, you, <laughs> <they've got> a- <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so then we cut to her in bed at 3 a.m. that night. Yeah, because it's always 3 a.m. somewhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this time the demons have turned on the tape recorder. Yeah, right. She wakes up to that. At first, she wakes up to all the screaming and everything. I'm like, I get it. I listen to podcasts as I fall asleep. It's different for everybody. <laughs> she also does the sit straight up in bed oh, as well. Yes. Just so you are particularly <laughs> enraged about this film. <laughs> all right. Well, obviously, this movie needs some help. So we're going to take a break and see if we can find a good pop scare for it. But uh, let me give Act 3 the hard sell first. Will Laura Linney get over all that annoying agnosticism? Why didn't God spring for a nicer locket? Is this movie negligent homicide? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the despicable conclusion of The Exorcism of Emily Rose. All right, Marsh, you ready to do the ad for Quip? I guess so. Yep, sure. I think it's going to be really great for people to hear about what a great product Quip is, especially from you, you know? Why especially from me? Because you know, you're, you're British. Right, and, and British people have bad teeth, yeah? Exactly, yeah. You know, that's that's largely a myth, you know? Oh, it, it is? Yeah, like, we have some of the best dental health in the world. Like, way better than America. Oh. I'm sure the ad copy I wrote will be fine, anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, so here we go. Um, Hey, hey, Marsh, when's the last time you got rewarded for brushing your teeth? Never. When I tried to brush my teeth, my father would beat me with a rake. Seriously, Eli? I didn't know. You should have told me this. um, Well, with Quip's new smart electric toothbrush, good habits can earn you great perks like free products, gift cards, and more. That's right. The Quip smart brush for adults and kids connects to the Quip app with Bluetooth. Uh, You can track when and how you brush, get tips and coaching to improve your habits. You can earn points for daily brushing and bonus points for completing challenges like streaks. 
And then you can redeem those points for awards like free products, gift cards, and discounts from Quip and partners. Plus, you can avoid the tangle of ivory in the center of my face. Tangle of ivory, Eli. I thought it was poetic. You sure can, Marsh. You sure can. Start getting rewards for brushing your teeth today and go to getquip.com slash awful right now to get your first refill for free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash awful. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash awful. Quip. Better oral health made simple and rewarding. What else to say here? My wife can't look me in the face when we make love because she says it's like looking into the open maw from one of those worms from June. Like, Eli, how would that even help the ad if that was true? Uh, it's a peep toothbrush. Quip. Mm, okay. Okay, is everyone here? Yep. Yes, Lord Satan. Cool. All right, so... This is the house of the lawyer who's defending the priest who tried to stop our demon plan. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's time we made sure that no one stood in our way. Excellent. Belial, I want you to stop her watch at precisely 3 a.m. Uh, okay. And, and Nero, you... Uh, are, are going to make a banging noise in the kitchen right afterwards. I'm, I'm going to make a, a banging noise in the kitchen. And while we do that, the, the, the watch and the, the banging thing, what are you going to be doing, Satan, Prince of Darkness? I will be catching up on Justified. Come on, man. Seriously? Well, it doesn't stream for like three months after the season airs, right? And we get terrible service in hell. This is the worst trip ever. (laughs) (laughs) And we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to open up with Father Moore finally able to take the stand in his own defense. And I love this little bit. We open this scene on him going like, so help me God, right? As if to say, see, he was a priest. He swore on a Bible. He couldn't be lying. (laughs) (laughs) They're not allowed. And they're going to establish something which is really terrifying and should make up a major part of the movie that doesn't, which is that he got permission to do an exorcism. Yeah. Right. And so to be clear, that happened in the real story as well, right? The murderers in the real story that murdered the girl with their murdery murder did get permission from their higher ups to do it. Although they were told to keep it a secret. Yeah. Yeah. And and did they get the permission on Halloween when things are, are at their most spooky or was that a, a, an addition for the film? I, I, I don't I didn't double check on that. I'm assuming that's bullshit. Oh. There, there is a great line with that. She's like, so you did it on Halloween just to what? To to be creepy? And, she, and he's like, no, no, no. It, uh, Halloween's magic. It's it's a magical time of the year. <laughs> also, he explains that he crammed for his fucking demon uh, exam. Yes. <laughs> was, we, we have a, a spell, but it's a whole big thing. It was real. But I, I was up. Oh, I fell asleep with the book in my hand. And, and look, this... That's not a good thing, right? Like, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> if I was going to have brain surgery tomorrow and the surgeon said I was up cramming for this all night, I'd be like, well, no, then. Nope. No, you weren't. <laughs> Turns out you were cramming for no reason, friend. <laughs> also, as we saw, it was very much an open book exam in that he had the Bible there with him. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, spoilers for this magic spell. It's going to be like, Jesus is cool. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. Exactly. What were you cramming for? (laughs) Well, there's a lot of contingencies. Uh, Mostly it just went normal this time, but sometimes things go wrong. All right. So, yeah, so we flash back to him sitting straight up as he awakens at 3 a.m. And honestly, like, I, I know you have to do that aggressively, but he goes so fast. He's very clearly, obviously, intentionally fucking with me personally with this one yes yeah it's a double fuck you know within the space of like 10 minutes in the film we've had two of these yeah right <laughs> but he wakes up at exactly 3 a.m which is you know it's because it's this movie's thing but then we get him on the stand explaining the significance he's like yeah 3 a.m is the witching hour it's the demon's way of just kind of sticking it to god the son and the holy ghost thing you know the whole trinity thing we got they it's like the opposite Except it's the same thing. It's, 
It's the opposite of when Jesus died. Like the demons get together and they're like, all right, he died at three. Yeah, we'll do our stuff at three in the morning. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking got him. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, they say 3 p.m. is the miracle hour, which yep. I've never heard anybody describe it. As I grew up Catholic, we never talked about 3 p.m. being the miracle hour. And no. this whole thing about 3 a.m. being the demonic witching hour, like... It is in folklore. It is that, but it's got nothing to do with the Holy Trinity. It's about when in the in the the, the book you were meant to be praying at certain times, and there was a gap around three a.m. I believe it was. It's nothing to do with like mocking the Holy Trinity. Wow! So they even made that. That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> So yeah, so he, he's he's telling this story about waking up at 3 a.m. He says, I smelled something burning. And I just want to point out that's this movie's language for he's about to have a psychotic episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whereas like famously, if you can smell burning, you're having a stroke. That's like the yeah, famous that's... thing about smelling. But either something's actually burning or you're about to have <laughs> Right, a yeah, it's one, one of the two. <laughs> Whereas when he says all this to the lawyer, she starts doing the, it all adds up kind of face from the end, like it's the end of <laughs> Usual Suspects or something. yeah. So he's so we get this little flashback of him walking around looking for his pop scare. He's out in the hallway and they start doing just weird fun house effects with the hallway as though that could be the pop scare. And we're like, wait, are we supposed to believe that that's actually happening to the hallway? And then we're like, no, no, it's just we were just never mind. Never mind with the hallway. Also, if you're a priest and a hallway starts to fill with scary demon shit, I get being surprised. But that's your whole jam, dude. <laughs> All right. This is if you're this is getting challenged to a fight at TGI Fridays if you spend every Saturday learning karate, right? Right. Do yeah. your shit. But he doesn't do his shit. He's just like, um, oh, I sure hope the angels are here too. You you fucking suck, dude. And I, I say this genuinely from the bottom of my heart. If a demon appeared in my home this evening, I would be so much better prepared than anyone yeah. in any of the horror movies right? we'd ever watched. Oh, yeah. I'd be like, Oh, okay. Either I'm insane or this is real, but I know all the words they say. So, pew, pew, pew. I've been <laughs> right. doing Jesus backflips and shit. <laughs> I'm like, look at this. I'm going to pull a sword from the air because nine out of 10 times you can just do that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yup. Sword from the air. <laughs> And the thing is, right, this is him him telling Emily's story, his big, I need to tell Emily's story. Yeah. And the fact that it starts with, I keep waking up in the middle of the night, is not a good start. <laughs> like, like, my granddad has to get up in the middle of the night. The problem is a prostate, <laughs> not a poltergeist. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and we back out of mid doodly do we back out of the story with the prosecutor, right? And he's going, wait a minute, are you fucking telling me that you looked in a window and you saw the literal devil nodding at you from your neighbor's fucking house. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> to which Laura Liddy replies, objection, he's harassing my witness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nope, I just said what he said. Yeah. I'm allowed to do that. Did you or did you not see a demon ghost in your neighbor's house? He's like, yes, yeah, I totally saw a demon ghost. He's like, how often do you see the demon ghost? He's like, pretty much all the time. Like, he's right behind you right now. <laughs> <laughs> and the prosecutor says, oh, no further questions. Is that really? Yes! You've got no follow-up on that. There's literally nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so now he she pulls out the tape, right? She's like, and now, uh, antagonist of the film, can you play this tape of the exorcism? And the protagonist, the prosecutor's like, hold on, man. She didn't say she had a fucking tape. You can't do this. And she's like, yeah, no, my, my surprise witness is totally based on this tape, though. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a judge, but your client failed to provide us with material evidence he had in his possession from the night he killed a mentally ill girl is not great for your case. Like, no! You act like this is really bad for the prosecution, the tapes emerge, but this is really bad for, for, uh, for the defense. Well, especially because the thing on the tape is him killing a mentally ill yes. girl. Yep. So, okay. But yeah, but that tape draws us back into the full-blown exorcism doodly do. So we're finally going to see the big exorcism scene. But ju just before we get there, it is worth pausing and pointing out the fucking grim thing about this is the defense in real life actually did play a tape of the exorcism at the trial. Yep. And they actually argued that it was demons and named the demons and they played that for the jury. This isn't uh, a movie thing. This isn't just invented for, for fiction. That is what the defense actually did. It's so fucking grim. Yeah, you can actually go and listen to it. It's in German, but you can go and listen to the tape. It, uh, it's online. Right. And it, by the way, don't 
but no. it's very clearly a mentally ill teenager. Yeah, right? yeah it's yeah. terrifying. Like, this movie adds a fucking horse and a cat attack. I mean, spoilers, <laughs> but like they add a shit ton of stuff to this tape to make it credible because the real tape is just a girl being like, I think I should get back on my medication, guys. I don't know about you, but yeah. this is not going great. Yeah, well, okay, so the, the exorcism starting off and right away you can see there's a serious goddamn problem. And if you've ever been, been into s and you'll understand it because right away he says, all right, don't pay attention to anything that she says. <laughs> right? I'm like, wait, you guys don't have any kind of say. So if she says specifically, there aren't any demons in me, stop hitting me with that. We're, we're going to we're going to not pay attention to that. Classic demon trick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apparently. Jesus, that's terrifying. Yeah, especially when combined with the, he's not saying don't listen to anything she says. It's don't listen to anything it says. So you're oh, right. not referring to the girl as it. This is not a good start. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Now, anything that comes out of her mouth is the demon talking. So if she says, please, please stop, I'm dying, ignore that. Yeah. Is his opening instruction. Yeah. So, but of course, it's it's cinematic. So we're about to do an exorcism. There has to be a sudden thunderstorm and a cross on the wall tips over and winds up upside down. Yeah, which presumably the jury could hear that on the tape. Is that what was that? Was that something <laughs> a crucifix turning upside down, turning upside like, down, rubble, 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 like on a different story of this house? <laughs> well, I love later on it when, when we come back out of it, he says, "Yes, the tape that you just heard and the additional things I told you as it was playing." You know, so they, yes. as if though they're going to fix that or whatever. Oh, this movie could have nailed comedy if they had just panned back out of the doodly doo and the priest is like, and then the horse is like, and the cat's like, and she's all like, right. Well, so you keep mentioning the horse. We should probably talk about all the weird animal attacks that happened during this exorcism, starting with the cat attack, which I love so goddamn much because it's like the bunny and Holy Grail. Right? <laughs> the priest is standing there going, get out, demon from Satan. And this chonker ass cat jumps up and grabs his throat. <laughs> but like, it does. Like, she unleashes upon him her army of cats for <laughs> one second. Right. Like, there's a fucking yes. Pokemon attack. Like, she's, she's <laughs> used cats. Zoomf, and they're off again. <laughs> So, yeah, so, but while the cats are attacking, she rips through her buzz. She, I don't know, smacks the guy or pulls his nuts off or something. And she <laughs> jumps out of a window a la reefer madness. Yep. Right. Apparently she's fine, by the way. Apparently she hit the ground running from that second story window. Because mm -hmm. the priest and, and, and his entourage all run down to, to chase her into the barn now. And they grab her in the barn and the doctor, remember our surprise witness, the doctor takes her heart rate and he goes, her heart rate is 180 beats per minute. And I don't want to be that guy, but that's not that fast. <laughs> well, she yeah. didn't just run into the barn. It should be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so they catch her in the barn. And, and now, by the way, all the horses are freaking out. And I'm like, oh, please give me a horse attack. We already had a cat attack. We know she can control animals. Please give me a horse attack. Spoiler, they totally do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the horse doesn't jump on him and grab his throat, which would have been way better. But <laughs> And this is where she's like yelling at him in German. It's like, oh, my God, that's so spooky. Why would she be yelling in German unless, you know, in real life she, she was German? So she was, <laughs> yes! she was just yelling at yes! him. Yes. Well, and that's the thing. It was like, wait, so at a certain point, they tell us the six demons that are supposed to be in her. One of them is Hitler. Yes. And so she's <laughs> yelling in German and we're like, oh, she must be possessed by Hitler. But yes, in real life. She was just She was just German. German. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. And there's this great moment. He's like, tell me your name. And I just wrote in my notes, should I ask Heath's mom? She'll blow you up on the spot for free. <laughs> 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 but yeah, the the uh the demons are Cain, Nero, Judas, Legion. Mm, nope, that was a bunch of them. <laughs> Belal, and then Satan himself. Oh, they didn't have because okay in real life she said Hitler was where the the, yeah. the girl did in in real life I guess mm. in the movie they took Hitler out because that was just too silly too fucking silly too <laughs> obviously silly but I love that the boss showed up right I really wanted to yeah. doodly do to like him micromanaging them oh so you're using the the cat attack now is that bad <laughs> tell me what you I feel like we're like we're gonna have do a you want to do later, this so. you're Satan <laughs> So why is Nero here? He's just like a king they didn't like. 
Also, like, I love how they say Lucifer's name last, like he's the headliner. Right, yes. Like, if you just said, like, like, inside me is Lucifer and then Kane, you'd be like, well, that's a bit of a step down, actually. I yeah, mean, right. You, yeah, exactly. You've it with the Lucifer thing so, <laughs> so, and while they're having this exchange, I love to all the, like, spiders and bugs and scorpions in the barn start coming out going like, you got this, boss? Or are you, are you going to need us? We're right here, man. <laughs> we got a cat attack and a horse attack. Yeah, and it's like, Dad, could you could you just walk over in front of that horse and stand there like like it's so it can kick you in the face like this is set up like WWF at this point point. Yeah. <laughs> just walk over the horse and stand there waiting to be kicked useless snake attack is the part of the movie where I had to pause because I was laughing so hard because the <laughs> demon snake lands on the priest but it's a fucking garden snake in the middle of go fuck yourself Iowa so yeah. it's just like that was weird right when I was on you <laughs> <laughs> But then we get the horse attack. The horse attacks the dad, right? And then the doctor has to run over and help him. And they're like, okay, well, now the doctor's not on the exorcism girl. We have to we have to give up on the exorcism. That scene's over, right? <laughs> it feels like that's bad prioritizing. Like I would I just stick to the end of the exorcism and then go back to the dad after that. Because of what you gotta start the whole exorcism again. There's gonna be another horse attack. Just you're this right. far through. Just, just <laughs> get this out, ticked off and nailed out, and then you can move on to the other things. All right. Well, but the the good news though is that the next time they'll know to board up the window. So yeah. yes. <laughs> all right. So we back out of that doodly do into the courtroom and and we look at the runtime on the movie and we think, well, this can't <laughs> possibly be more than another eight or ten minutes, right? But no, thirty five fucking minutes still in oh, this yeah. thing. <laughs> so much movie left. But yeah, he explains that like after the horse attack, that it just really taken all the mood out of the exorcism, so they stopped doing it. Again, to be clear, this movie is lying because they performed 67 exorcisms on the girl. Yeah. But their story to make themselves look good is, yeah, I mean, we tried once and then we were like, fuck it. Did you, she hit us with a horse. Yuck. <laughs> no, no. Their story is uh, we did it once and then she didn't consent to any others. So we respected that because we're really good with consent like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's their story here. Yeah. Us Catholic priests and consent, you know. Mm -hmm. So and the priest comes in he's like hey you know look i never told her not to listen to her doctors i just contradicted what they had told her and then implied she would burn in hell if she believed them instead of me so really if you think about it i i, I just i i just also gave her advice i was just a helpful neighbor if you think about it yeah, yeah he, he specifically said i never said she should quit seeing her doctors it's like right you just told her to stop listening to her doctor. you can see them right. all you like just don't listen to the doctors Right. Well, even in the movie, and I don't think this is actually real in the in the story, but even in the movie, she's like, but you did tell her to stop taking her medicine, right? And he's like, well, be, uh, well technically, yes, I did. <laughs> Funny story about that. Ultimately, we both felt she'd be on medical care. And the we there was a mentally ill teenager and the priest who believes in literal demons. And the two of them got their, their minds together on this. It was a great meeting of uh, consensus. Right. I mean, it seems like you're too full of demons to cure for me. What do you think? I want a spider to eat. All right. So one vote for eating a spider and one vote for demons. Like, to be fair, if she needed a second opinion, they could have asked the voices in his head as well. And that would have been enough of a consensus. Yeah. <laughs> and again, the prosecutor is like, okay, so just to sum up, you think you have a tape of demons and you're bringing it up here and now because you got in trouble? And the priest is like, yes. And the prosecutor's like, Awesome. Yep. Yeah. Thank awesome. you. Um, I wanted a boat anyway. Yeah. Well, and then the prosecutor points out, she's like, he's like, okay, so we see her, we hear her on this tape speaking a bunch of different languages. Um, to be clear, like she spoke those though, right? <laughs> like, and he's like, oh yeah, yeah, she did. Like Greek and Hebrew and a little Aramaic, a little Aramaic. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just so so we're clear. That's not like an unexpected thing. She actually did know those like yeah, mm -hmm, sure did. Also, she it's not like she was speaking highly complex versions no. of language. At one point, she's just counting. Right. Which, you know, I can do that in several languages I don't know. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly, right. And she only had to get to six. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then also, like, so in on the tape, it sounds at a certain point like there are two voices talking at once, which is, of course, a classic demon thing. And he explains the double vocal cord thing. I don't know how real this is. It did send me on this really awesome rabbit hole of overtone singing on... YouTube, check that shit out if yeah. you haven't before. Mm. It's really cool stuff, but way cooler than the real thing, which is that 
if you yell into an old tape recorder, it distorts and sounds like two voices. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Which is what's on the tape, by the way. Oh, like when it? people try and bring this tape up, they're like, listen, you can hear the second voice. As someone who edits sound, no illusions, you would be like, no, she's just the membrane too it. loud. Yeah, right. Too close to the <laughs> mic. Yeah. It's not like the voices are saying different things at the same time. Yeah. Unless their second voice is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. So they're like, okay, she's, she's like, uh, do you want to re uncross examine your witness? And she's like, no, I do want to, I do want to reserve the right to bring him back to the stand uh, later because he's really our only A lister. <laughs> <laughs> so that, there's that. But she's like, but now I want to call my surprise witness who definitely didn't die or commit suicide since he agreed to take the. Oh, shit. He's not here. Oh, oh. shit. I can't imagine what would have happened. <laughs> but the judge gives her like a bonus day to find her doctor, which was nice. Very really nice of her. Thoughtful yeah. of the judge. There's no way they needed a full day to find him either because he's outside. So his <laughs> not showing up to the courthouse was to go all the way to the courthouse, but not go in. Like, how hard did you look for him? And did right, that involve yes. out of any window because he's there? <laughs> right. He's just... In the parking lot. Or he's in a parking lot, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, he's just she just walks out to the parking lot. And she's like, oh, there you are. I guess we didn't have enough time left in the movie for a whole big driving scene. That's a big thing. <laughs> but he's all demon haunted now. And he's like, I can't do it. The demons are real. And then he backs into a, a car that's an oncoming car. And he gets hit by a car to death. And it's way funnier than I just made it sound. That's oh, so funny. <laughs> I really wanted a demon to come out and take a picture of him for Geico. Oh, this is fucking this. My greats are going to go crazy <laughs> because of this. <laughs> this is the worst. So, yeah, so she's super sad now. So now it's time for alcohol from a coffee mug drinking, right? <laughs> so that's that's movie for not just normal amounts of lawyer booze. Yeah, her, her boss walks in and he's like, hey, you uh, Having a mug of scotch? Are you a <laughs> podcaster now? You have to tell us if you're a podcaster now. But, like, she drinks a lot in this film, but at no point does she even seem remotely drunk. No. Which misses the point of having a day drinking. Yeah, right? <laughs> Damn it. So yeah, but her boss comes in and and he wants he wants her badge and her gun. Damn it. You know, she, but she needs just one more chance to win the case. And we're, we're supposed to be upset that she might lose her job over this, but... She's really bad at her job. The two things we know about her are this case and the time she exonerated a multiple murderer who went on to kill again. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. The best thing for the world is for her to lose for her, her to fucking lose her job. job. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but she gets, but the boss agrees to give her one more chance to, you know, make the murdering of a child morally justifiable. Damn it. <laughs> So she goes back to the jailhouse to tell Father Moore about the dead surprise witness, right? Right. And so, like, first of all, he says to her, you've been crying. And it's like, yes, but, like, in her office she was crying. Did she cry all the way over there, all the way over to the jail? <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, is he's, he's upset that his friend has died in an accident. And I wrote, quick, tell him it was an exorcism. He won't be upset. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but he's like, hey, look, I don't give a shit about this dead guy. We we don't really have time for me to mourn or anything in this film. We have 26 minutes of runtime left and I still have to. And some of that's going to be credits and I still have to tell Emily's story. Damn it. Right. And surely she should just say, OK, tell me Emily's story. And he's like, no, I mean, I, I really want to do it in front of the audience and the witnesses and stuff. <laughs> I feel it's more dramatic if I do it. If I right. tell you now, it's, it's missing something. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, yeah. And she's like, well, I really don't know. My boss just told me he's going to fire me if I put you back on the stand. I'm not so sure about that. And then he gives her this letter and he's like, here, here is a letter from the victim that completely exonerates me. Uh, just remembered that I had this. <laughs> it was just weird because they let me take it into jail. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've had this in my butt cheeks for a very long time. <laughs> so, yeah, so he gives her the letter to read. And then we immediately cut to her reading it late that night. And this is where she turns the, the, the alarm clock around. And I thought, yeah, that's oh. smart. Then the demons won't be able to tell when it's 3 a.m. So they won't be able to do anything. <laughs> very clever. Oh, right. Clever, clever. But this letter, I guess, is going to be the, you know, whatever, the picture of the tire tracks from my, my cousin, cousin Vinny. Vinny. Uh, yeah. of, of this film, right? So we we get her like pushing 
through the press the next day trying to get to the courthouse one last time. This time, by the way, totally wearing the bullshit locket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. classy. So she's like, our surprise witness got killed, Your Honor, by a car, but we are going to recall Father Moore to the stand for bonus insanity. And we see, like, Comb Fiore, like, get pissed off and march out of the courtroom. He's like, God damn it, I told her not to do that. <laughs> And he says, you know, Emily thought this letter was really important to share, which is why I didn't. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. Which is why I saved it as a surprise, like the best true things. <laughs> yeah. And then she presents to him the problem of evil. Yep. Right. She's like, why would God let something so bad happen? And, and uh, the protagonist, once again, he's like, objection, theodicy. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but luckily... This letter is going to answer once and for all why God let six demons torture a 19-year-old girl to death. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Father Moore says, you know, I can let Emily answer that. And if he'd have got out a puppet and started doing an event act, it would not have been any more crazy or manipulative than he's been so far. Oh, but it would have been as funny. <laughs> he's like, yeah, so this letter takes place in a doodly-do. So we doodly-do back. We're post-exorcism now. Emily walks outside into the demon fog one early morning. And in the demon fog, there's a demon tree. And, and she comes across herself laying down in the ground with poop on her face or something. Yep. yep. They're not super clear about what that thing on her face is. It looks like poop, which means either she smeared poop on her face or she's just been laying there so long, something shit on her walking by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it gets crazier. Yep. Because who who should show up? <laughs> but Mary, the, the virgin mother of Jesus. Mary. And hey, credit to this movie. At least this movie is smart enough not to actually show Mary, the mother of <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, we back away to the priest and he's going like, yeah. So um, turns out Mary, Virgin Mary, that that's the Mary, uh, showed yeah, you've up. Heard of her, you've heard of her. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Jerusalem. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so she shows up and she explained that God has this really weird plan by which he could torture her to death with demon possession and thereby scare more people into Catholicism. <laughs> yes. And here's the brilliant meta thing about this, right? God wants to torture this teenager to death. So that they can make a scary movie about it. <laughs> yes, exactly. We don't get more people to be Catholic. Exactly. I really, I mean, Emily, of course, is like, oh, whatever, the will of the Lord. I really would have loved a little more pushback on that plan. <laughs> Emily, Emily. Mother Mary. Emily, I want you to know Heaven is not blind to your pain. Oh, oh, that's that's good to know. Yes, but you must always remember... Because I have these horrible seizures and I've been eating bugs and, and breaking my teeth. Yep, yep. Like no. really ripping them right out of the skull. Yes, uh, I understand that. But worry not, for your pain is not in vain. Oh, excellent. I knew there was some higher purpose to my unimaginable suffering. I can't wait to hear what it is. Yes, there is. Your suffering will make more people believe in my son. S sorry, um, just to clarify, heaven is allowing me to be filled with demons, to, to live in torment and to die so more people will be Christian. Catholic. Right, yeah, subsect. Yeah, okay, okay sure. Um, But... <laughs> Don't take this the wrong way, but could you could you just, just appear to people, you know, the way you're appearing to me now? It seems to like that would just work a whole lot better. Oh, I I show up all the time. I sometimes I appear on toast, fruit, all over the place. I've done uh, it. Right, but maybe you could just, you know, show up like this, all magical and, and talking and stuff. Uh, talking and magical, yeah. I mean, it seems a bit much. Right. right. Yeah, I guess we don't want to be unsubtle. Um, mm -hmm. Look, I suppose if it's God's will, can I just ask, how many people will this convert? Yes, my child. Almost seven. Almost seven? Four. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, 
oh god this look that's the thing about all of these religious movies and possession movies and stuff if they let us have all of the scenes they would be as ridiculous as we make them sound on this show right <laughs> yep so yeah so but emily's like oh wow virgin mary me dying would be proof of god huh and we're like we're like, no, no, not at all, because <laughs> because schizophrenia and epilepsy. If if God hadn't also made schizophrenia and epilepsy, then yes, <laughs> this yeah. would totally work. <laughs> and obviously, the only evidence of any of this conversation between Emily and Mary are in the letter that the priest produced on the final day of a trial that's been going really badly for him that he is now reading aloud. This is the only, this obviously didn't happen in real life. This is the filmmaker just absolving mm. all of the people who led this girl to her death, 100%. But he might as well have ended the letter by saying, and therefore, Father Moore is innocent. Signed, <laughs> definitely, definitely, Emily, definitely, Emily, the end. Yes, <laughs> right, right, exactly. And also, by the way, I, I don't want to glaze over this. This movie's answer to the problem of evil is that it's okay to torture a 19-year-old to death if it sufficiently proves your own existence. Yeah. yeah. Just want to make clear that that is the moral underpinning moral of, this of this film. This movie. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. And also, like, quick question to the doctors who are listening, right? If your patient tells you that their suffering is necessary in order to let people know the devil is real, do you A, high five them and say, get on with that, or B, ask them politely <laughs> to take their medication? <laughs> And if you didn't, would you go to fucking jail? Yeah. yeah then, okay. Yeah. So, and then the final question, she's like, so uh, why did um, why did Emily not want any more exorcisms after the first one where she jumped out of a window from a second story bedroom and was manhandled and tied to a thing and broke her knees and shit? And he's like, oh, she just couldn't couldn't take it. <laughs> she uh, enough. She tapped out. We have a we have a strong tap respecting policy here <laughs> in the Catholic Church. Yeah, right. He says like she wouldn't submit to any more. And hey, you know, I'm all about the consent, as we've very clearly established. So okay, so now the protagonist gives us his closing argument, right? <laughs> he reminds like so so at the because at the end of the priest story, he's like. You know, and then she she had stigmata because why the fuck not, right? Her her hands and her feet, and I saw him. I swear. So the protagonist points out, he's like, "Oh, by the way, um, we don't really need a way to explain the the Christ like wounds on the person who had a documented history of self harm and mm -hmm. psychopathic religiosity." So, moving on, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to God Awful Movies. Yeah. Where each week we take a look at a different movie. <laughs> so he also points out, he's like, hey, man, like, I, you know, I'm religious. Uh, statistically speaking, most of you in the jury are religious. We always manage to do that without murdering any college kids. Weird, huh? Weird. Yeah. He's like, and by the way, reminder, the defense's case is this picture. And he shows him the picture again. And he's like, so just, just to be clear, this is God's plan is his defense. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, you know, I'm a man of faith, but in the courtroom, it's facts and not faith that matter. And I wrote, oh, 2005 American legal system, brace yourself, you sweet, innocent angel. <laughs> <laughs> this speech is so good. I wanted Laura Linney to just get up and sit at his table and be like, I'm the prosecutor now. I win. Yeah, right. I expect her to wander off like the guy at the end of Eight Mile or something. Yeah. <laughs> There's a moment where she almost does because he stops and then it's her turn and she just sits there for a moment. And I was hoping she's like, fuck, yeah, he's right. I yeah, got sorry. nothing. I yeah. <laughs> But instead, she's like, uh, I thought you were a man of faith, huh? Yeah, high five everyone. I've got him. It's like, no, not really. No, no, no. Her closing statement is, because again, I was kind of bummed out by his statement because it's based on a true story. And like, mm. that's really fucking sad. And Laura Linney gets up and is so ridiculous that, again, it made this movie a comedy again. Because she stands up and she's like, things exist or don't. I win. That's the only <laughs> statement she says that I said yes at the end of. And then every, yeah. every other sentence you can punctuate with, no, does it then? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. Well, so her entire case is, 
when you say that you're 99.9999% sure, what you're really saying is you're 0.0001% unsure, <laughs> right? So, like her, her entire closing argument is, so you're saying there's a chance. Yes. Right. Which, by the way, the answer to what she's saying, is there a chance of, is literally no. Yep. Right? Is it possible that God chalked that 19-year-old full of demons so that we'd believe in his son? Nope. nope. No, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> is it a fact that she was psychic and hypersensitive, like the expert said? Nope. Nope. No. 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 Just, it's just, it's just, be, we can do this all day. <laughs> no. <laughs> so. But yeah, but she closes on... The, the one thing I do know for absolutely sure is that Father Moore loved Emily. Yeah, and her tone is like, if anything, his crime was loving her too much. It's like, no, his crime was negligent homicide. Were you not paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, that's the exact opposite, actually. All right, so, so now it's time for the verdict, because this movie is as eager to be over as I am for it to be over. The jury finds Father Moore guilty of negligent homicide because... Oh, God. When when the form of the jury hands the judge a note, I want it to be another undeclared letter from the dead girl. So actually, <laughs> this just in. <laughs> Wait, Emily would like to chime in. She's been on the jury the whole time. <laughs> yeah, but so the judge is like, we'll do this sentencing on April 12th or whatever. And Laura Linney is like, oh, actually... um we need to wrap this movie the fuck up. Can we just do the sentencing now? And she's like, yeah, that would be silly for us to do a whole nother scene, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's like we, we've only got Tom Wilkinson for like one other scene after this, so we really <laughs> need to get this moving. Right, yeah. So she's like, okay, so I sentence you to, and then the jury's like, oh, can we, can we do this sentencing? And she's like, why the fuck would you be All able right, to do this? just this one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, right. Um, but the jury recommends... No punishment whatsoever. Time served. They recommend that he literally gets away with murder. Yeah. And the, the really, really upsetting and sad thing about this is this is what actually happened. Yep. Yeah. They did put forward the fact that no, the parents shouldn't get anything at all because they've suffered enough of having gone through what they put themselves and put her through. Mm -hmm. And the priest gets time served. So off you go back into the world. Oh, God. So grim. Yeah. Yeah, it's fucking terrible. So, okay, so we, we wrap things up. We go back to the bar where Comb Fiore gives her back her badge and her gun and realizes that, man, she did a great job exonerating that guy who was obviously guilty of negligent homicide. After all, she should get to be a full partner at their law firm. But she didn't exonerate him. Nope. He's very happy and impressed that she managed to get a verdict of guilty because he, he got a guilty <laughs> verdict. Yep, yep. And he's like, now you can be a partner. And she's like, I don't want to be a partner anymore. And he's like, why wouldn't you? That doesn't make any sense, given what... What do you want now? I don't know. We just <laughs> felt like the character should change because that <laughs> signals growth. Yeah. And it was like the archdiocese, you know, feel that the, the, the trial raised public interest in the church, which is like, yeah, I mean, what they mean is at least it took everyone's mind off the rampant pedophilia that had been coming. <laughs> yeah, out. right. It's a different right. scandal to direct them at. <laughs> exactly. All right, and so it just one more time to emphasize just how predictably stupid this fucking movie is. So final scene, it's raining and we're like panning down from the rain past some trees and we're like, oh, we're in a cemetery, aren't we? Yep, it's a cemetery. <laughs> stupid bullshit fucking movie. So Father Moore and Laura Linney are standing there at Emily's gravestone, right? Having their final chat together. And he got to choose her epitaph? What is that? What is that? It's like, well, you know, it, it's only he, he murdered her. He gets dibs. That's how that works. Yeah, right, right. Well, and the, the epitaph is fucking terrifying. By the way, it's work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. A statement so insane that Kierkegaard, in the time he lived, named his book about how dumb religion was after that quote. He was like, oh, I'm going to call it fear and fucking trembling. That's fucking stupid. It's like, it's, I, I just, I, I read that and I'm like, wow, that's a great reason to never pretend that book is real. It's amazing <laughs> how many single sentences do that in that book. Be afraid. Very afraid. <laughs> yes. <exactly. laughs> Loving God. <laughs> All right, so, and then we get Laura Linney putting all her trial stuff away in her box. I expected a warehouse from Raiders of the Lost Ark type situation, but no, she just puts her shit up. Like, it, 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 we watch her so long, she goes to bed at this point. I'm like, are we just going to watch her live the rest of her life? <laughs> we do. I, my All of my final notes are nothing, 
Nope. Just, just the lady? Just going to watch her fall asleep? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, of course, the movie gives us a couple of little title cards worth a wrap up. Right. The movie says now that murdered girl's grave is an unofficial shrine to homicidally religious people all over the world. Nice. Yeah. And that's also true. It, it is a place yeah, of yeah. pilgrimage to people for people. Oh, God. Oh, also, they point out that Father Moore went into seclusion. Yep. Yeah. He didn't appeal his conviction because he got fucking lucky and didn't have a leg to stand on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Why would he appeal it? He, yeah. The priest was like, phew, I'm going to go fucking hide so Noah and Eli don't kick me to death. <laughs> right, yes. And then and then it comes up and it's like, and Laura Linney's character cashed in on this case and made a lot of yep. money off the death of an innocent young girl. Yeah, the lawyer shared her notes on the trial, shared her notes on the trial, which went on to be published research that we exploited for this awful film. Yep. And yep. fun fact, the lawyer in the real case was a guy called Eric Schmidt Leitner, who had previously made his name as a lawyer for the defense in the Nuremberg trials. So he was there. Oh, no shit. Nazis. Consistent. Was like, That's wow. what I we need right now. <laughs> wow. Everyone, everyone deserves a, a fair trial, but when you're going to that lawyer, you know you've got a case uh, to, to try and fight. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, that's that's a fucking fascinating little nugget. Okay, so to close things off, I'm putting you guys on the jury, and I'm going to ask you for the sentencing recommendation that we should have gotten for Father Moore. Oh, oh, Laura Linney has to defend the Catholic Church from now on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd sentence Father Moore to uh, have to be present in the room anytime anyone watches this film so they can see how clearly he is the bad guy. So he can be there and witness that on their faces. Oh, wow. That's a pretty good one. All right. Awesome. So that wraps that one up. Man, that was a lot harder. I watched that movie before many moons ago before I was a skeptic. I didn't realize how bad that shit was. I didn't realize how hard that one was going to be to get through. It was rough. Um, so, Marsh, thanks. Thanks again. Thanks, as always, for coming on and suffering alongside us there. Oh, always a pleasure, guys. Yeah, cheers. And by the way, if anybody uh, is new to the show and they haven't really been paying attention, where should they go to hear more from you? Yeah, so uh, you can hear me on the Skeptics with a K podcast every fortnight. Um, you can hear me on Be Reasonable once in a blue moon, let's face it. And you can check out the stuff I'm doing uh, as editor of The Skeptic at skeptic.org.uk. Awesome. And of course, all that will be linked on the show notes as well. And well, that does it for our review of uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still have more of Eli's like celebration or whatever he calls it. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, the Republicans are counting their chickens hatched. No, or seriously doubted by Nate Silver. So we're going to be watching the documentary Trump 2024. Life oh, after the president. Oh, that's actually, that's that's a good fucking thing for the Helltacular or whatever it is. <laughs> so with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 270 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Marsh for suffering alongside us this week, and a perhaps even a huger thanks to all the Patreon donors to help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing ADS Citation Data, D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Card, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email God Awful movies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Trash on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Martin Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a little chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bostic, I'm no illusions. Promise to work harder and another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. But the priest sincerely believed he was right, went on to become the law in the United States. Yeah... The six demons inside Emily Rose went on to found a very successful reality show. Eli turned all his clocks back by three minutes, so whenever there was the demon witching hour, they weren't able to stop the clock on 3 a.m. Kind of ruined their whole thing. Clocks. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.